Hi, and welcome back to our series of videos on Kubernetes security fundamentals. In the last video, we had started looking at how Kubernetes handles authentication by looking at client certificate authentication. And in this video, what we're going to do is carry on our look at some of the different authentication methods that Kubernetes provides uh, as internal features. So just as a reminder, before we get started on kind of the practical aspect of it, there are essentially three steps to how any request to the Kubernetes API will be processed prior to being admitted to the cluster. First of all, we have which what we're looking at at the moment, which is authentication. It has to be done by a valid user. Um, then authorization. Does the user have the right to do whatever they're trying to do? And then lastly, admission control. And admission control can do various things to validate the request or even mutate it as well. But they're pretty similar across the way. Now, focusing in on authentication, um, one of the important points to know about Kubernetes authentication is that you can have multiple authentication modes available. And if any of those are acceptable, then the request will pass authentication and head on to authorization. So in most clusters, you'll typically see a number of these, some in built and some third party. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a look, bit more of a look at some of the more of the inbuilt ones. Uh, and we're going to start off with quite a specialized one. So which is bootstrap tokens. So Kubernetes bootstrap tokens are used for a very specific purpose, which you can probably guess by the name, uh, which is they're used when you're bootstrapping new nodes. So essentially the node has to authenticate to the cluster and it doesn't have any credentials at that point. So it needs some way of doing that. And that's what bootstrap tokens are. Um, and whenever you have a, a cluster, therefore you'll probably see some bootstrap tokens. So let's take a little look and see how that works. Uh, go to here. So what we got is we got our little standard kind cluster, which we always use for this. Uh, and it's a fairly newly started cluster. So we should see a, uh, a script. Let's go and look, uh, get secrets plus A. Uh, and we can see here, we have got a bootstrap token. These bootstrap tokens exist in the cluster for a day after they are created. There essentially is a Kubernetes controller that will usually clean them up in most clusters, so you shouldn't see an accumulation of these, but they're there for a period of time, so they are available. Um, and we can actually look at how this is all set up by just looking at the details of that secret object, which is the one that contains the bootstrap token. And what we get back is we get back um, a series of fields, uh, and we can see that there is a secret and a token ID. Um, these essentially are base64 encoded, uh, as all Kubernetes secrets are. Uh, so if we want to um, actually see what's going on inside one of these. We're just going to do X clip and do that. And what we'll see here is a this value here. This is the token secret. Now this, I'm sure you can tell, is not exactly randomly generated. Uh, this does kind of depend on the distribution as to how this is set up. Uh, as we're using kind, kind is very much not meant for production use. So they've just got a static value, uh, which is just, you know, 1 to 0 to 9 and A to F. Um, and, but this is a valid token, right? This is a valid authentication for this cluster. Uh, and we can actually authenticate to the cluster using this token and see what access that provides. So why would, why is this important? Why, why do we care about this? Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna to authenticate to our cluster and we're going to use the token that we were provided, which is here. Uh, and then we're gonna do auth can I minus minus list. This is a very useful Kubernetes command, which essentially lists all of the permissions that a given authentication credentials got. And when we enter on that, uh, we'll see a couple of interesting things. You'll see that we can we can do create, uh, certificate sending requests. This is so that we can essentially, the kubelet on a, on a new node can get its proper credential, its long lasting credential. Uh, and we can see that it's got this as well. So it can create these requests. And they can also get nodes, right? So it has to be able to look at the nodes that are available in order to, to create the credential. So whilst this credential, um, you know, it's not cluster admin or anything like that, there are definitely scope for an attacker who had one of these to do something like, for example, create a fake node. And there's been some researchers who've kind of explored and looked around to that concept. And obviously, you can see very clearly here, bootstrap tokens are in no way designed for ordinary users. They have this very specific purpose and they should only be used for that. I have read about one uh, um, company who apparently did use bootstrap tokens for authentication, for general authentication. Um, so, you know, it's not to say it's never used, but I would definitely say never should be. <clears throat> but 
you do have to be quite careful to make sure you're managing these tokens because they do have some rights that could be misused. Um, so they're definitely one to keep an eye on. Don't like put these on, on um, uh, any open areas. Do keep them safe and secret. So that's, that's bootstrap tokens. Fair limited use, but interesting to know that those exist. And they are a valid authentication method for a cluster. The next one I want to talk about a little bit is static token authentication. Now, static token authentication um, has been around in, uh, in Kubernetes for a very long time. It's one of the very oldest authentication mechanisms, and it is still valid. The way it essentially works is here you will have a file with a static set of creds. So you essentially have a, a list of credentials, a list of users, and a list of tokens. Anyone who provides one of those tokens to the API server gets the assigned the username and groups that are in the file. So it's a really fairly kind of basic file. And, and we can look at a kind of example of one of these like this. And we can see here, this is just a, an example one that I, I put together. Uh, we've got some random tokens. Uh, we've got some strings for the usernames and we've got some group memberships as well. Now, to an extent, for very small environments, very, very small environments, this might be something you want to use. Um, it's very simple to use. You just create a CSV file and, and, and make sure the API server process can see it and then configure a startup parameter on the API server. But I will say, obviously, that um, this is not suitable for scaling or suitable for large environments for a variety of reasons. From a security standpoint, the most obvious of these is this is a clear text file with credentials held in the clear. That's not a good idea. There's a lot of risks of this leaking or of someone getting unauthorized access to it. Generally speaking, never a good idea to hold credentials in the clear. But from a usability standpoint and a kind of how easy it is to operate, um, a notable point here is if you want to change any of these, you want to add a user, change a user, delete a user, you have to restart the API server uh, to make that have effect. So that's obviously pretty clunky at scale. Uh, and the other one is if you have a cluster with multiple control plane nodes, so multiple different instances of the API server, um, you have to essentially manually or find some way of synchronizing this from one to another. So again, this is not something I would ever expect to see in production. I have seen a couple of um, Kubernetes distributions that use it for maybe like a, a bootstrap, some kind of, or some kind of like system user. Um, but in general, this isn't something again, you'd use in production. So that was a look, a bit of a look at um, a couple of different other authentication mechanisms that you get uh, in Kubernetes, a couple more of the inbuilt authentication mechanisms. And what we're gonna do in the next video is we're going on to look at service account tokens. Now, service account tokens are something which do get used a lot in production clusters, and there's some interesting aspects of how they work and what they do. Um, so we'll be we're covering that in the next video. As ever, if you would like more information, please do go to the Security Labs blog where we've got sort of more details on this and lots of other topics. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video.